Jag blev lite Men det var bara det som var okej. Så alla, oavsett vad man gör så har man något konstigare än tidigare. Tyvärr se till att de inte blir verkligare in. Rökmaskin går ju bra. Döm mig nu.
Ja. Då tänker jag att jag ställer mig vid kameran först. Oh, ja, <laughs> och eh, Anna kanske, du, du kanske vill se presentationen tänker jag. Ja just det, ja, precis. Ja, precis. Let's do this. Eh, är vi ute? Uh, we, uh, yeah, okay. So, uh, welcome very much, uh, everyone, both in this room and online. And I think it's especially nice to see some of oh, some old faces that I recognize that I haven't seen in a while. Uh, uh, but uh, so I'm Matthias Avetik. Uh, and uh, sorry, I took things in the wrong order now. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, in this situation, you can become a bit nervous, but that's just things that happen. Anyway, uh, welcome to this session where Hanna Karlsson uh, will present uh, or defend her thesis entitled, and this I have to look up, uh, Precipitating Amine Absorption System for Carbon Captures. Uh, so, I'm Matthias Alvesi, as I happened to say earlier. Uh, I'm a senior lecturer at this department. Uh, while also uh, being the head of department of our sister department, the Department of Food Technology, Engineering and Nutrition. That's quite a mouthful. Uh, and I will be sharing this defense. Uh, so we're very pleased to welcome uh, the appointed uh, faculty uh, opponent, uh, opponent appointed by the faculty, I should say. <laughs> ah, this is... <laughs> yes. <laughs> Ah, yeah. uh, <laughs> so, Hanna, Kno uh, Hanna Knotla, uh, professor at the Division of Energy Science, uh, Lule, sorry, professor at the Department of Chemical Engineering, I should say, at the Norwegian University of Science and Technology, that's NTNU. Uh, her main research interests are related to acid gas removal. Uh, using absorption technology with modeling and experimental activities for developing and characterizing solvents for uh, hydrogen sulfide and CO2 removal, currently focused on solvent stability and solvent degradation studies. Uh, then we are also pleased to see our grading committee here. And first we have uh, Chao Yan Yi. <laughs> Sorry for the pronunciation. Uh, professor at the Division of Energy Science, uh, Luleå University of Technology, there we have that, LTU in Sweden, uh, where she leads a research group working with developing ionic li liquid-based technology for energy application with a focus on CO2 capture and separation from gas mixtures. Uh, and then we have uh, Francesco Balsagli, researcher at the Italian uh, National Con Council for Research, Institute for the Chemistry of Organometallic Compounds, so that's CNR ICOM, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, working with CO2 capture, utilization and storage, that's CCUS. I guess we will see some abbreviations today, <laughs> I would suspect. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, and then we have Dr. Jonathan Lee, a senior lecturer in chemical engineering at the School of Engineering, Newcastle University, working with process intensification of solvent-based uh, post-combustion carbon capture using rotating packed beds. We also have two deputy members uh, of the examination committee present. And uh, the first one is Karin Eriksson. Associate Professor at the Environmental Engineering, uh, sorry, Environmental Energy Systems Studies, the Department of Technology and Society at Lund University. Once a colleague of mine, actually, <laughs> when I happened to work there. Not very nice to see you here. Uh, she has extensive experience in the fields of energy and environmental system studies, technology assessments. Uh, and policy analysis, currently working on decarbonization of the plastic sector and forest industry and electrification of biomass conversion uh, via C CU, so carbon capture and utilization, right? Yeah. <laughs> you got this. Thank you. <laughs> uh, and then we have Mats Galbe as well in the, as a deputy member. Uh, Mats Galbe is a senior lecturer uh, in chemical engineering at, at our department of chemical engineering at Lund University. 
uh, with research mainly directed towards production of renew renewable fuels and materials from lignocellulosic feedstocks, especially uh, by ethanol, but also for polymers from cellulosic uh, materials. Uh, with us here today, we also have the main supervisor, Helena Sensom, uh, who is the senior lecturer at our department, and her co uh, and Hannah's co-supervisor, uh, Christian Hulteberg, professor at our department. So the layout of this session as, is as follows. Uh, first, the defendant, Hannah, uh, will give a presentation, giving an introduction and then presenting uh, main aspects of her thesis. Uh, we will then have a quick leg stretch, so a technical break for those who desperately need to uh, re-establish their water balance. <laughs> and uh, after that, uh, and during that, we will reorganize here, uh, moving the camera and so on. And, and Hannah and Hannah will sit down at the tables. Uh, and after, after that short intermission, the most important part of this session starts, and that's when the opponent and the defendant is having their discussion on the topic. Uh, after that, the opportunity is given to the grading committee uh, to ask questions. And when the examination committee is satisfied, uh, you in the audience, uh, also online, I think is possible, right? Uh, uh, have an opportunity to ask a few questions. Uh, is it through, um, yeah, it's, if you're online, it's through the comment in YouTube. Uh, and after that, I will close the session and the examination committee will have a closed meeting. And uh, more on that later. But before we do anything else, uh, let's see where we have things. I guess you have one of those. I have, and I have to double check that the sound is off. You who are online don't have to do that, but <laughs> it's good if you that are in here do that. So, uh, please. Thank you. Let's see if I can get this presentation working online as well. Do you see it the way it should be? No. Ola? No. I see uh, your uh, what you see. Uh, so share uh, screen two instead. Let's see. Perfect. Now we're good. And you see it the way it should be as well. Perfect. Please, let's do this. <coughs> Good morning, everybody, and thank you all for being here to listen to me today when I will talk about my thesis, uh, which is called uh, Precipitating Amine Absorption Systems for Carbon Capture. I would also like to thank the opponent and the grading committee for taking the time to read this thesis, which then, of course, would be the topic of today's discussion. Is my stuff working? No. So there it works. Ah, now. And now it works. Perfect. Okay. <clears throat> so I will start with a brief uh, outline of the presentation that I'm about to give today. Uh, first, I will give an introduction uh, to the field of carbon capture, uh, why we need to do it, what it is, and how it is done conventionally. I will then move into the research that I've been doing, which is a non-aqueous AMP systems, where I will uh, briefly state my research questions and work you through my uh, research, through my research papers. A lot of research going on here. Uh, I will then end with conclusions <clears throat> and an outlook for future work. But first off, why do we need to capture carbon dioxide? Well, since the end of the 19th century, there has been an increased use of fossil sources uh, or fossil fuels, uh, which has led to an increasing um, uh, increased emissions for uh, carbon dioxide. 
And since carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas, the accumulation of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere will lead to uh, global warming and um, climate change. The year of 2020, the carbon dioxide concentration was measured to 412 ppm uh, compared to pre-industrial times of uh, 280 ppm. And because of this, um, there is a, a real need to try to uh, reduce our emissions in order to lower our impact on uh, climate change and global warming. I'm not going to dwell too long on this uh, because I think you're all familiar with this topic. Uh, if you're not, you can turn on any choice of media these days uh, with the COP26 going on ending today. Right, so um, there is a big problem still, and that is the, that we are still very dependent on fossil fuels. A majority of the global primary energy still comes from fossil sources, such as coal, oil and gas. And the energy demand worldwide keeps increasing. This is why we need to switch into the use of renewable resources and biofuels. However, if we want to meet the, um, the climate goals that we have set during this century, uh, we need to um, uh, do this switch pretty uh, fast. And this transition is not moving along as fast as it should in order to do this. And this is where carbon capture and sequestration comes into play. So what is carbon capture and sequestration? Well, carbon capture aims at capturing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, or no, uh, in order to avoid it to accumulate in the atmosphere. And there are various ways that we can do this, uh, but one, which is deemed one of the most promising techniques, is amine capture. And amine capture aims at capturing carbon dioxide uh, from gaseous streams, such as flue gases from industry, in order to avoid them to be released and accumulated in the atmosphere. If we then take this carbon dioxide and send it for sequestration or utilization, uh, we have the possibility to reduce our emissions. Uh, right. Uh, and we typically talk about CCS in the context of fossil fuels uh, in a way to reduce our emissions uh, and in best case scenario, not emit anymore. However, you can also talk about CCS in the context of biofuels, we typically called this bioenergy and CCS or BEX. And in this way, uh, we have the possibility to create carbon sinks where we can achieve negative emissions, where we could actually reduce the carbon uh, dioxide content in the atmosphere. And one way that uh, BEX could be implemented is through the process or production of gaseous biofuels, for example. So uh, biogas is an example of a biofuel, uh, and it's typically produced from bacterial conversion of biomass. And during this production, uh, a lot of carbon dioxide is produced as well, and it can contain carbon dioxide levels of up to 50 or above uh, percent. However, if we want to use this biogas as a vehicle fuel or inject it to the gas grid, we need to reduce the carbon dioxide content to levels of 3% or below. And this is the limit for Sweden. It might vary a little bit worldwide. Uh, so this is called biogas upgrading. Uh, and amine absorption uh, can and is currently uh, one of the techniques that are being used for biogas upgrading. And um, if this carbon dioxide uh, is then sent for sequestration, we have the possibility to achieve negative emissions. So <clears throat> what is amine absorption? Well, um, conventional systems that are used commercially today typically use as aqueous amine solutions. So amines or amine mixtures in water. And here are some typical examples of our amines that are being used. And out of these, these uh, monoethanol amine, uh, uh, has been used for quite some time. It is often considered a benchmark solution since um, there is a lot of data available due to the extensive amount of research that has been going on uh, for this system. Uh, there are currently systems that are developed that are actually better than MEA, but I have used MEA throughout my uh, thesis in order for comparison reasons or for explaining how the technique works. So these aqueous amines are then used in a process. So let's look at a very simplified schematic of what such a process might look like. So you have a gas that you want to clean that contains carbon dioxide, and this enters an absorption column. And absorption is usually uh, or typically uh, performed at lower temperatures, around 40 degrees. So when this gas enters this absorption column, it comes in contact with the amine solution and the carbon dioxide reacts. 
the clean gas exits at the top, whereas the amine solution, which now has a high concentration of carbon dioxide, the rich solution, is pumped through a generation column. In the regeneration column, uh, the temperature is higher than in the, during absorption in order to reverse the reactions that are taking place. This way, we get carbon dioxide back as a gas, whereas the amine solution, which is now low in CO2, we call that the lean solution, is transferred back to the absorption column for reuse. So this is a cycle. And there's typically some heat exchanging going on between the streams as well. So for water-based system, um, in order to reverse the reactions, you need temperatures of 120 degrees or above, or at least for the aqueous MEA case. And since I think all of us know this, that this is above the boiling point of water, uh, which means that a lot of water will be evaporated during this process. This means that the energy requirement for the regeneration step is quite high. Uh, and this uh, is the, uh, can account for as much as 70 to 80% of the operating cost of an MEA um, case using a simple uh, capture design. So in order to find a way to lower the energy requirements and make uh, carbon capture a viable uh, option for industry in terms of cost and energy requirements, um, a lot of research today is focused on ways to reduce uh, the energy requirement so that um, yeah, uh, we can make it more energy efficient, basically. And this is where my research lies. Uh, I look at alternative absorption solutions for carbon capture in the form of non-aqueous AMP solutions. So what makes them non-aqueous is the fact that we don't have water in these systems. Instead, we have an organic solvent. And the organic solvents that I have looked at have a higher boiling point, a higher solubility, physical solubility of CO2, and a lower heat capacity than that of water. The amine that I have studied, AMP, is a sterically hindered version of MEA. And because this amine is sterically hindered, the reaction products it forms with carbon dioxide uh, will be less stable than other carbon that's formed. This means that we can regenerate, regenerate it at lower temperatures compared, compared to conventional systems, but also that we get solid uh, precipitation. But let's look at the reaction mechanisms that happens in systems like this. So the first thing that happens is that carbon dioxide gets dissolved into the solution. And it is this port we call the physical absorption. Once in the solution, if, if the uh, organic solvent itself does not participate in the reactions, two AMP molecules react with one carbon dioxide in order to form the carbamet and counter ion. This carbamet and counter ion can then come together and form the solid precipitate. And in this way, we will have carbon dioxide captured in a solid crystal. Um, <clears throat> because it requires two AMP molecules to react with one carbon dioxide, um, the maximum loading due to chemical reactions in this case is 0.5 moles of CO2 per mole of AMP. And because we get a solid precipitate, this allows us to potentially use an alternative process design for the capture process. Let's look at a simplified schematic of what that might look like. So in the same way, um, as for the aqueous case, we have a gas that we want to clean uh, that enters an absorption column and the clean gas exits at the top. The carbon dioxide re reacts in the solution and the rich, uh, rich solution now is now a mixture of uh, liquid and a solid. We have a slurry where we will have carbon dioxide in the solid phase. Well, part of a carbon with salt. So potentially we could here introduce a separation step where we remove some of the liquid without heating it and only send a concentrated slurry for regeneration. Then during regeneration in the same way, we increase the temperature, we get the carbon dioxide back as a gas and the now concentrated amine solution is pumped back to the absorption column. So because of the steric hindrance that I mentioned earlier, this regeneration step can be performed at lower temperatures but also there might be energetic benefits of only heating part of the solution. Um, yeah, uh, because it's lower amount to heat basically. So these systems have potential to lower the, the energy requirement for regeneration. So that brings me to uh, my uh, research questions that I have uh, posted in my thesis. The first one, under which absorption and regeneration conditions could different non-aqueous AMP solutions be suitable for carbon capture? 
And with conditions here, I mean temperatures, partial pressures, uh, amine concentration, and the fact that we get precipitation, as well as water accumulation, since most organic solvents are hygroscopic. My second research question is, which are the potential benefits of using non-aqueous AMP solutions compared to conventional aqueous amine systems? Uh, and following this question, of course, also, which are the potential challenges? But let's dive into my research. Um, throughout these five years, I have looked at AMP in the combination with these eight organic solvents. The first system that I studied was AMP in NMP solution, uh, which is the topic of paper one. And in this paper, I looked at the absorption behavior in these systems at two different concentrations of AMP using reaction calorimetry. And by using a setup like this, uh, it is possible to simultaneously measure the CO2 solubility in these systems, as well as the heat of absorption. So these are data for 25 AMP systems. Uh, the solubility of CO2 uh, gives us an indication of how much CO2 that will be in the liquid at a certain partial pressure in the gas. And if we measure this uh, at different temperatures, it is possible to estimate the rich and lean loadings that we can achieve during absorption and regeneration. Uh, the data points marked in orange here, maybe it's quite hard to see, but uh, there are some, at least in orange. Those are the points where we had precipitation in the system. So by knowing the rich and lean loadings, it is also possible to estimate the cyclic capacity, which I will talk a little bit about in the coming slides. The reactions that I showed previously are exothermic, which means that heat will be released as they occur or if they move towards absorption. And this we measure in terms of heat of absorption. Um, yes, so basically how much uh, heat that is released with the reactions taking place. Um, but these plots here are quite crowded. So let's look at a case where we only look at 40 degrees, typical absorption temperatures. And the highest temperature that I measured, 88 degrees, which will correspond to the regeneration temperatures. Starting with the solubility. So <clears throat> in a case where we have, um, I, will, I will look at two different cases for uh, partial pressures of CO2, starting with 10 kilopascals. In this case, we will be able to load our system to a loading of 0 0.2 moles of CO2 per mole of AMP. Um, and in this case, we won't have precipitation. Um, however, if the partial pressure in the gas is higher, 25 kilopascals, we have the possi possibility to load our system even more. And in this case, we also have precipitation, which you can see here um, as the loading is increased when the precipitation occurs. So we will be able to reach uh, rich loadings of 0 0.4. During regeneration, if we assume that our organic solvent is not evaporated during the process um, and that we do the regeneration at atmospheric pressures of carbon dioxide, we will be able to get lean loadings uh, of 0 0.05. The difference between these are then the cyclic capacity, uh, which gives us an indication of how much amine we need to capture a certain amount of CO2 in a continuous process. And if we look at that for these two cases, uh, for 10 kilopascals, uh, we have a cyclic capacity of 0 0.15. And this is quite low compared to an aqueous MEA case uh, where we you typically get cyclic capacities of above 0 0.3. However, at the higher partial pressure case, uh, the cyclic capacity is similar to what we can uh, achieve for conventional system suggesting that these systems require a little bit higher partial pressure in the gas in order to, to be compatible or comparable at least. Right, then for the heat of absorption for the same data. <clears throat> uh, before we get precipitation in our system, uh, the heat of absorption is around 90 kilojoules per mole, uh, accounting for the reactions uh, of the, uh, forming the carbonate. When we finally do get precipitation, we obtain these really high values here of above 200 kilojoules per mole of CO2. Uh, this is because the precipitation is also an exothermic process. And we get a lot of pre precipitation happening at the same time because our system is super saturated. So these values here will be higher than in an equilibrium case. 
Uh, this is also indicated by the fact that the uh, heat absorption drops again after we um, have this initial precipitation point. After we have reached a loading, um, the maximum loading due to the chemical reactions taking place, the heat of absorption drops by quite a lot. And this is because um, most of our amine has reacted at this point and that it's uh, uh, the reactions taking place is basically just this first one, the physical absorption where CO2 gets dissolved in the solution, which has a lower um, value in, in the heat it releases there as it occurs. Yeah, right. Uh, then during regeneration, we can see that our values in heat of absorption is overall lower than at 40 degrees. We also um, don't see these high values uh, because we don't have precipitation at these temperatures. Um, and uh, uh, because the uh, heat of absorption is lower, um, this suggests that less reaction takes place at these temperatures and that we have a higher ratio of physically dissolved CO2. Right, so then let's uh, move forward. Uh, I also used AMP and NMP solutions in my fourth paper in the thesis, uh, studying the absorption rate. And I studied the absorption rate using a setup with a wetted wall column. And in this setup, you have a, a solvent flow over a defined surface area. So you can then measure the uh, CO2 content in an ingoing gas and compare that to uh, the CO2 concentration in the outgoing gas. And you can estimate how much that has been absorbed in the liquid over this surface area. So you get the CO2 flux. And the rate of absorption is interesting because it helps determining, uh, or by knowing that you can estimate the uh, residence time needed during absorption, which controls the sizing of the absorbing unit, uh, as well as the amount of liquid that you need, of course. And uh, I measured the CO2 flux in both uh, uh, non-aqueous AMP solutions and in uh, aqueous MEA case, and found that the flux was overall higher in our non-aqueous case. And from these data, it is also possible to estimate the uh, mass transfer coefficients, uh, which I also found were higher in our non-aqueous case. And a potential reason for this is that we have so much higher physical solubility in our organic solvent compared to water. However, there is one major drawback or uh, yeah, with these uh, experiments and that it's we need to perform them at initially unloaded solution and avoid to get precipitation as we measure because otherwise this defined surface area will be obstructed and we won't know to be able to estimate the flux. Because of this, these data don't really represent um, the conditions that would be in a, uh, true during absorption for our system since we would get precipitation which means that in the future we need to find alternative ways to measure this uh, that also allows us to have precipitation as we absorb right uh, there is a, another potential drawback with using nmp as a uh, organic solvent and that it is because it's cmr class because it's reproductively toxic uh, and thus it is classified as a phase out chemical within the European Union. So because of this, in paper two, I performed a small screening study of these seven uh, organic solvents here. Um, but I'm not going to show data for all of them. I'm only going to show for the top three ones here, which were the most promising candidates, uh, which is DMSO, uh, DMAPN and PEN40 degrees, because we wanted to see whether we got precipitation in this system, which is sort of uh, the point of our research. Uh, and in these graphs here, they show the solubility and heat of absorption at 40 degrees and 25 AMP. You can see our um, original system of NMP as these uh, filled diamonds. And one of the systems, pentanol, had a lower solubility than NMP. So we had a lower loading at uh, lower partial pressures or higher partial pressures. It appears above the data here. Uh, two of the systems, a DMSO and DMAPN, had higher solubility. They are the ones under our original data. And the system where we used DMAPN, or I used DMAPN, uh, had a lot higher solubility than the rest. And this is most likely because it precipitated immediately with the uh, first injection of CO2 uh, and uh, is probably not super saturated as the other cases. Uh, we can also see this in the heat of absorption data here, as the DMAPN data 
is overall higher because we have the additional heat of precipitation here. Uh, and we don't get these high, um, high values as we do for the other ones. The MSO and one pentanol behave very similar to MMP, where we had the lower values before uh, precipitation. Then we get these high values when we do have precipitation, suggesting supersaturation. And then after a loading of 0 0.5 here, they all behave very similar, going, moving towards physical absorption. Right. Um, so from this, um, this study, uh, we decided that AMP in the MSO was the most promising candidate and uh, that, we were, that I was supposed to look at that for the uh, future evaluation. And the main reasons for this is, of course, that it's less toxic than uh, uh, NMP. It has a high boiling point of 189 degrees. We obtained precipitation. And also we had higher solubility than our original system. Um, also, uh, it behaved overall very similarly to the AMP NMP case, suggesting that uh, the previous knowledge that I had gained or we had gained on the NMP system uh, could be used here as well. So because of this, in paper three, I performed a study uh, uh, looking at a more thorough evaluation of the AMP and DMSO system. And um, overall, uh, the conclusion from this study was that the AMP and DMSO uh, system uh, behaved very similarly to the NMP system uh, in the temperature range that we studied. We got precipitation at 25 to 50 degrees in the same way. However, the solubility is not only higher at lower temperatures, it is overall higher in our system or slightly higher atmospheric pressures of CO2. And we got a comparable cyclic capacity as before, so 0 0.3 at 40 degrees. However, we could obtain this cyclic capacity at a lower partial pressure of CO2, suggesting that this system uh, uh, might be more applicable to a wider range of applications compared to our previous system. In this study, I also looked at the uh, distribution of reaction species in solution. And this I did at, or we did at a lower um, amine concentration because in the same way as for the wetted wall column, we wanted to avoid getting precipitation because we don't get, see the solids uh, in the NMR spectra. Um, right, so this is the data done for the 10 weight percent AMP DMSO system. And uh, we saw three uh, main uh, reaction products, which are the first three peaks here. The first one, uh, which is assigned to the AMP carbamate that arises from the reaction with CO, is assigned to bicarbonate. Uh, that we get from the reaction with water. Um, because the MSO is very hygroscopic, water will most likely accumulate from the air, uh, which is why we see bicarbonate formation in a system like this. The third peak here is assigned uh, tentatively, I should say, because we haven't really confirmed it, um, with CO2, so, uh, which uh, suggests that this is a possible side reaction that can occur in a system like this. The fourth peak we can see here is the physically dissolved CO2. So as we increase the temperature in this system, we can see that the peak starts to decrease in intensity and broaden. And this applies that the interaction between the species and the equilibrium reactions is increased, uh, suggesting that the ratio of dissolved reaction species changes as we increase the temperature, uh, which also supports our theory that we, had, uh, that we have more physically dissolved, um, a higher ratio uh, physically dissolved at higher temperatures. So because of the uh, hygro hygroscopic properties of the MSO, um, I performed a study in paper five, where I looked at the influence of water in a system like this. Um, right, and I did that for the AMP DMSO system. Um, so if your solvent is hygroscopic, that means that if the gas that we want to clean in our capture process is humid, which it is in the biogas case, there will be an accumulation of water in the system over time. And water uh, uh, content leads to bicarbonate formation through this additional reaction taking place here. Um, and this means that it opens up for an uh, other potential reaction route, right? Uh, and could potentially cause problems as if we don't get enough AMP carbamate to form the solid precipitation, um, the, we might not get precipitation if the water content is too high. So in this study, uh, we also performed a NMR uh, experiment using carbon-30 NMR. And we basically saw that we, ha we had added 4% water to a 10 weight percent AMP system. The ratio between the uh, 
AMP carbonate and bicarbonate formation was changed. So we have more bicarbonate in this case, as we expect from the new reaction mechanism, or we didn't see before. Uh, and this we have tentatively assigned to one of the degradation products of our amine, um, but it's not confirmed yet. Uh, so this, this suggests that um, degradation might be more pronounced if there is water in the system, but also we need to perform a lot more experiments in order to verify this. We should also mention that uh, we only went to 80 degrees in this first study and up to 88 degrees in this case. And this peak is also seems to be irreversible, as we can still see it when we cool the sample back down to 30. Right. So I also performed um, uh, reaction calorimetric studies here, uh, looking at the solubility at uh, regeneration and absorption temperatures. And when we had added water, so this is for 25 weight percent AMP with either five or nine weight percent water. Um, so with increased water content, there was also an increased solubility uh, at both 88 and 40 degrees. However, the cyclic capacity that we could obtain were still similar when we had added up to 9% water. Also, we were able to achieve or we got precipitation in all the systems up to 9 weight percent, suggesting that some water accumulation might be tolerable while still being able to work this system as a biphasic system. Work. Um, as for the temperatures that we could use uh, during absorption and regeneration, I found that we can perform re regeneration at temperatures below 90 degrees, which is a lot lower than, or not a lot, but it's lower at least than um, for conventional systems. Uh, absorption, however, needs to be performed at lower temperatures as well. So we need to keep the temperature in the absorption below 50 degrees in order to obtain precipitation and get high enough cyclic capacities. As for partial pressures, regeneration can be performed at atmospheric pressures of CO2, uh, while still achieve low lean loadings of below 0 0.1. Absorption needs to be carried out at slightly higher temperatures than what is seen, for example, power production flue gases. Uh, so at above 20 kilopascals, uh, preferably as a general conclusion for all the systems I studied, um, in order to get high enough cyclic capacity as well, or comparable cyclic capacity. Um, because we need to get precipitation in order to have uh, a comparable cyclic capacity. You're going to be so tired of me after this. <laughs> um, um, we need to have a higher AMP concentration or presentation, but if you read a thesis, it's included there. Uh, and lastly, um, water accumulation. We still saw precipitation at nine weight percent water, uh, suggesting that some water accumulation might be tolerable, but we need to evaluate this further. So for the potential benefits of using these types of system, um, they are uh, linked to the lower regeneration temperature, uh, the fact that we have an organic solvents and we get precipitation. So by lowering the regeneration temperature, it is possible to use low grade heat, which are more available as excess energy in industry. Um, also the fact that we have an organic solvent mean that we could reduce the amount of vaporization occurring during regeneration, potentially lowering the energy requirement or at least heat requirement. And lastly, because we get the precipitation, um, we have the potential to introduce a separation step, uh, which means that we would need to heat less solvent overall uh, during regeneration. Then, of course, for the challenges. Um, these types of system will require a totally alternative process design compared to conventional systems. So you would need to have process units that are able to handle the formation of solids. Um, also, because we have precipitation, um, the energy released will be slightly higher, meaning that cooling will uh, be required during the absorption step in order to keep the temperatures uh, at te uh, below 50 degrees so that we have precipitation. Um, the viscosity of these types of systems uh, are also higher than conventional systems since we have a slurry, and this will affect the work needed to pump the solution as well as it will affect the heat transfer in heat exchangers, uh, which could also be a potential challenge. And then of course, the water accumulation again. Um, if we have a system where the properties is altered over time, uh, this is not really uh, desirable in a process like this, at least not if it alters a lot. 
Um, and if we get to the point where we don't have precipitation, it could actually be a real problem if you want to use it as a biphasic system where we do some separation, right? So for the outlook uh, for future research on systems like this, uh, we need to find an alternative way to determine the rate of absorption um, that allows us to have precipitation while we measure. Uh, so we need to do this uh, in order to get more realistic conditions to make any proper estimations on the absorption column. And speaking of testing under more realistic conditions, this system also needs to be tested um, uh, on the continuous operation where we use gases more similar to what we can find in industry in order to see what actual rich and lean loadings we will be able to get and the cyclic capacity, as well as we need to evaluate how this separation step would work, how much liquid we could actually remove while it's still functioning. And also the water accumulation again, um, because we will have like gases leaving and different temperatures, we need to study how severely this water accumulation will be under these uh, more realistic conditions. And lastly, of course, we need to evaluate the uh, environmental impact of a system like this in terms of volatility and degradation of the amine. And these um, uh, properties or these, uh, these things here also affect, uh, can affect the cost of carbon capture as if we have a, a lot of solvent disappearing or degrading in our system, we need to add more during uh, a continuous operation. Right, so that concludes my presentation today. I would like to end with thanking the organizations that have funded my research, which is the Swedish Energy Agency, Göteborg Energy, of Mistra through the STEPS project. I would also like to thank my supervisors for their support, so Helena and Christian, thank you, as well as my co-authors, Meher, Peter, Hatun, and Magnus for contributing and doing a lot of work, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Not as much as, yeah. <laughs> Anyways, let's get, let's stop there. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. So, thank you very much for a, a nice presentation. Uh, very interesting. Uh, uh, now for the small technical break uh, to reach a more lean uh, water loading <laughs> of your body, you find facility upstairs.
<laughs> ja, jag godkänner. <laughs> Det är bara kyss och fest när man har det. Uh, so welcome back everyone. Uh, and uh, so now we start the most important part, the discussion between the defendant and the opponent. So please. Thank you. Um... Anna, it was of course a pleasure to read this. As you can see from all the markings <laughs> and everything I have done, I uh, I really enjoyed it. Yeah. So um, thank you. So I have prepared some questions. Yeah. And then actually, I would like to use part of the time to actually have more of a discussion. So I have some bit concrete and bit maybe tiny questions first, mm -hmm. but then we're gonna look into the bigger picture and take bit different parts of from the thesis. Yeah. Yeah. Um. On page seven. Yes. You write under the picture, figure one, you write mm -hmm. there that since the absorption reactions are usually exothermic, heat is evolved. Yes. And, and, and you talk about CO2 capture. Do you have any examples where it wouldn't be exothermic? Uh, no. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, I, I was just, just curious about it. Yeah. Um... I am not a chemist, <laughs> <laughs> oh. so I did not dare to say that they're all exothermic. Yeah, yeah. So you're I playing mean, safe, <laughs> I guess. Yeah, that's that's okay. That's okay. I was just curious because I, I couldn't come up with any, and I was wondering a bit. You get an email then a week later, going, "I know one." Mm, yeah, 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 yeah. I, I would be happy to. Please let me know if you find one. <laughs> yes, I will definitely. I haven't found one yet. As I said, no. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, let's maybe take that one at the end. Um, you were working with the wetted wall column. Yes. And uh, I was wondering just uh, about the setup in general. Yeah. Um, I have two questions. And the first question is that how much of the CO2 that entered the column was actually absorbed during the... 20% uh... um, approximately. Okay. Um... Because, so yeah. I measured it relative. So I had I calibrated and the ingoing gas, and then saw how much it decreased in percent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So around I think it was twenty percent. Uh, it's five and a half years ago. Okay, okay, seven. yeah. But it was in that range. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And and the reason why I'm asking is that we have a different setup. Yeah. Uh, we have wetted wall column also, but we use a different way of operating it. Yeah. And and we we recirculate the gas. And we just measure the amount of gas we have to add to keep the concentration oh. constant in the gas phase. So we are able to operate with very much smaller absorption rates. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that's why I was just curious that uh, how, because you need to have a certain amount of CO2 because you are doing, of course, a subtraction of yes. in out. And if they are very like, then you get extremely high exactly. uncertainty. Um, on the same topic. Yes. The, you have a figure on page 23 you have a figure seven which is just the design of the column yes and um because we have a problem <laughs> at the end you are wondering how you have solved it <laughs> here uh, i might have that problem too yeah that's <laughs> what i'm wondering about it and and um, so so our problem is that as, as you can see, you have to remove the solvent at the bottom of the column. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. How do you control how much solvent is when it when it when it comes down on the on the wetted wall, yes. on the outside of the wetted wall, the film? Yes. And then you have some sort of accumulation at the bottom. Yes. How do you how do you take out a controlled amount of liquid all the time? I had the pump like right after, but I mean we had problems with the wetted wall column that the <clears throat> liquid level was rising, right? Yes, yes, exactly. I guess that's your issue too. <laughs> that, that is our issue too, that the, because you have to be very careful that if, as soon as if it rises a lot or yes. a little, you get, of course, a different mass transfer area, right? Yes. Yeah. Mm. So I had like, um, on the pipe, I had like a, a vent with a syringe 
that I could, when I saw that it started, like I had to watch it <laughs> practically the entire time, uh, which was full day experience. <laughs> and then I stood there and manually controlled that the, um, I saw that the liquid, because um, the outlet of the uh, solvent are three pipes. And then it's like in this uh, Teflon, uh, filling basically so it has this decrease in it so that I saw that the liquid was even with the channels in this Teflon thing um, yeah yeah okay so so my wish that you would have an option for how to automate this you don't have it no no I, uh, no I because really, we also sit yes. there and look at it for eight hours a day. Ask, actually, and no one gonna... likes it everybody hates it we have a diff bit different setup of getting it out but we still yeah. end up in the same situation yeah i had a discussion with the one phd student over at ntnu at a conference hoping that they would solve my issues but <laughs> no <laughs> no 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 well, we, i was hoping that you would solve our issue no i don't uh, know how they do it in uh, in austin uh, i've seen it but i can't remember maybe that's where i got the idea of the syringe actually yeah i don't think it's very automated there either no that's my understanding mm -hmm. i think uh, they use a syringe as well in uh, in at dtu yeah we, we try to use overflow mm -hmm. Uh, but uh, even that one is not so perfect. No. Um, and and uh, and the, there are changes when the temperature changes and mm. the viscosity of the solution changes, so it starts yeah, yeah. to flow different. Uh, it, it's it's not so simple. Yes, I know. Um, but okay, so no solution for that one. Sorry. No. <laughs> mm, okay, okay. Then. Um, You have, of course, worked with different concentration of AMP. Yes. Why those concentrations? Do you have any reason for that? Yes. Uh, the first reason, um, we used 15 and 25 for uh, AMP and NMP. And that was basically because that's where uh, the articles that was published before I started used those concentrations. OK, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. that's a traditional way of choosing your concentrations. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. And then for the DMSO paper, we lowered the concentration to 10 weight percent because uh, we wanted to get uh, absorption data and heat of absorption so that we could compare it where we don't have precipitation uh, at, for the experiments, <clears throat> potential future experiments as well, where we want to look at the system without solids. Mm. Uh, have you tried at all higher concentrations than 25% AMP in any of the solutions? Uh, no, I have not. Uh, not above. Do you think it would be reasonable to try? It all depends. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes. Uh, if, if, if you had to, I mean, definitely it would be interesting to try higher than 25 mm. weight percent. Mm. Uh, but if you have too high as well, I mean, the, there will be a lot of precipitation and I guess the, um, uh, this won't be very easy to work with anymore. So we had some cases like, um, using solvents where that precipitated uh, quite a lot and that was very hard to work with in our reaction calorimeter as it would form this like cake on the top uh, of solid um, so i guess there is a limit to how high you can go right yeah so so you think that the limit actually would be the amount of precipitation you get that you, you yeah because get you still want high. it to mm. sort of have some sort of flowing properties <laughs> I guess. Yeah, if I guess. Want, I guess. Yes, I agree. It, yes, if you want to pump it, yes, I agree. Um, on a page thirty. Yes. You have actually a very nice, honest com discussion or uh, discussion about the potential challenges, which I really enjoyed. Um, and you mentioned that maybe a lower temperatures in the absorber would be needed. Yes. Uh, this, of course, comes with the further disadvantages. Definitely. You need to cool more then. <laughs> you need to cool more. And also build the absorption column with the intercooling more extensively, I guess. Um, but what about the height of the absorber? What do you think would yes, happen yes. to that? I mean, if you lower the, the, the temperature, the reaction rates will be lowered as well. Mm, mm. So, I mean, there is, of course, an optimum there, um, which um, I really haven't looked at. Mm, <laughs> but mm. uh, yes, definitely. Uh, I, I was also wondering, do you know anything about the rates of 
of precipitation? Because I, I wondered, are they temperature dependent? Because your system, I would guess the absorption would become limited based on how fast you are able to precipitate, mm -hmm. right? Um, one of my co-authors, Meher, mm -hmm. I know she looked at that. Um, and I can't remember exactly what she uh, came up with, except that it was a slow kinetics. I, slow kinetics, so yeah. So I don't remember. Maybe it actually wouldn't make a big difference. Maybe. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm just, uh, I think for aqueous amines going down from 40 to 20, mm. your tower heights will go super high. Yeah. But uh, for your system, if it's already slow, maybe you don't lose so much. Maybe. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm just guessing. <laughs> it would be really interesting to try this out. <laughs> oh, I agree. <laughs> um. Uh, on the same page, you're mm -hmm. actually at the bottom of the page. Yes. You say that um, the last sentence, for precipitating solutions, precipitation at somewhat higher loadings could be beneficial, as it could allow precipitation in a, in a designed part of the absorption column. Designated. A designated part, I'm sorry. Um, yeah. And, and I, I see where it comes from. Mm -hmm. I absolutely see, and but I, I wonder if you are being a bit too negative. I think also it will <clears throat> be quite hard to uh, keep it uh, super saturated since we will have so many nucleation points in an absorption column. So I don't know if that would actually be possible while running it continuously. Um, but of course, I mean, the idea stemmed from the additional heat of precipitation which if you could like only have precipitation at the lower part of the absorption column, you could sort of uh, focus your cooling there, which might uh, be more um, beneficial, but I... Okay, I, I yeah, that's I the was, idea. Yeah, I yeah, yeah okay, that's, okay, then I understand better what you were thinking, because I, I thought that maybe you're being a bit pessimistic here, that I was thinking that if you already have to design the second half of the absorber to tolerate solids, maybe you can just extend it, maybe ah. it's not such a big big deal, but I see the point of, of the cooling. Yeah. 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 So, um, but um, maybe we can continue a bit on the supersaturation. Yes. You said that maybe that would be difficult to control. And this is, of course, a known challenge Yes. to control where does your system precipitate. Exactly. Do you have any, any proposals what one could do to try to control it better? I mean, there is the, the, uh, the nucleation, right? So if you have precipitate that you add, it will probably- um, Yeah, some seed. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, and that I guess you could control it. I mean, temperature as well, right? It, it precipitates at lower loadings at lower temperatures. So, but then you would add cooling. <laughs> um, yeah, no. Yeah, but, but yes, I, yes. I think I think I guess I guess those are the options. Yeah, yeah, which I comes to my uh, my mind also. So yeah. Um, and then if we can look at the figure fourteen at page thirty four. Yes. Um. Maybe we start so that maybe you can just explain the figures to me one more time. Yes. I, I mean, I did read the text, but. Uh, so this is uh, the data that we get from our calorimeter. Mm -hmm. So usually the pressure uh, stabilizes. And then when we do, if when we get precipitation, there is a slight decrease in pressure uh, as the precipitation occurs. Uh, but in some cases we saw that instead of, um, decreasing the pressure slightly increased instead and this typically this behavior typically happened at higher loadings uh, close to the maximum theoretical loading um, so this does not um, the pressure that i used for the solubility data is of course the pressure where it stabilizes in the end so this is just the initial signal that we saw from the calorimeter mm. So yeah, but uh, but uh, if on the upper picture, you, one can see that the pressure is almost, it's basically constant. Yes. And then it goes down. And, yes. and at the same time, of course, you release heat because you start to precipitate, right? Yes. 
And in the second one, it's because um, it precipitated quite uh, soon after um, the in, uh, injection of CO2. So this okay. is where it's about to stabilize um, after the injection of CO2, and then it's increased. Huh. So in the first case, the injection happened earlier, and mm. then it stabilized, and then after maybe 15 minutes, because we have set it to equilibrate in 30 minutes, right? So it precipitated later on. Not yeah. After, yeah. Okay, okay. So, so the second part is, is not related to the, the lower picture is not related to the fact that it's higher loading. It's, it's just related to the fact when the, mm. when the precipitation happens after yeah. the injection but, of CO2. But the lower uh, picture is from where the precipitation happened at higher loading okay. compared to... Actually, I don't remember exactly uh, which loadings I took these data from right now. Yeah, because yeah. I just started to wonder that that could if it's related to the high loadings, that could there be a possibility that there's something else precipitating than what precipitates at lower loadings? Absolutely, we actually saw that in the um, NMP system. We could see that it seemed to form some sort of second precipitation uh, where we got this, but then we got like proper. Um, we could actually see that the pressure decreased a lot like, okay. the second time. Um, oh, that's we, interesting. We also saw that we had two uh, different um, crystal mm -hmm. in our NMP system, but we haven't done any evaluations like that for our DMSO system. So that's definitely a possibility. Yeah. Um, oh, on the same page, just above the bigger figure, mm -hmm. you, you state that uh, there are many parameters such as pH, viscosity, and risk mm. constant and dielectric constants, all of which affect the solubility of CO2. Oh, and uh, okay. I wonder I wonder about, the, uh, no, this is not the, in any way criticism. I was just wondering, yeah. how, how did you, how, how, how do you think that, or what is the idea behind when you say that viscosity directly would impact the solubility? Uh, it affects, no, sure. It affects the mass transfer, right? Yes. So, it affects the kinetics. Yeah, but, but you haven't seen any correlations where the physical solubility or the solubility of CO2 would be related to, correlated directly to the viscosity, because I, I haven't seen that. No, no. Because I for me, either. it's normally the mass transfer. Mm. No, I think also like the, the solvents that I, I mean, of course, cyclohexanol was uh, quite viscous, but uh, <laughs> the other solvents have very similar uh, viscosities. So. I haven't really seen any difference like that. Okay, that's uh, that's nice to understand better what's happening in the figure 14. And uh, then I'm also happy to to hear that you agree with me that the viscosity is for the mass transfer. <laughs> because otherwise I think I would have had to uh, say, I'm sorry for some people if you would have now come up and told me that, uh, that it's not the case. Um, Let's go to page 35. Yes. Which is actually the next page. Yes. Which is actually sort of the only sentence in the thesis where I was a bit unsure what you try to, if I understand correctly what you say. Ooh, interesting. So it's the, it's the last sentence above the figure 15. Yeah. You As, know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I see. Uh, yes, uh, it's very hard to put that down in words. <laughs> yeah, yes, yes, I, I agree, I agree. So the idea is that if we have precipitation occurring all the time, like the amount of CO2 that goes in reacts and it precipitates. But if it's supersaturated, it will be uh, well, dissolved, right? And then at some point, more would precipitate there <laughs> than if it's precipitated immediately. Yes? Yeah. That's what I um, am trying to say, which means that if we had like um, evenly distributed precipitation happening, there would be like a, a more even heat of absorption. Whereas if more than, if it was not supersaturated, it would precipitate at the same time. That's when we get these really high values. Okay, 
then, then, then I understand what you tried to say, because the, the way I read the sentence, I first thought that you mean that if you get super saturation overall, the heat released will be different than if you would have it all the no, way through. No. And that I was wondering. The accumulated amount yeah. of heat would be the same. Yeah. Right. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Perfect. Yes. <laughs> um, let's look a little bit about uh, NMR. Yes. Which I think actually you sort of maybe answered my question in the presentation. I got a bit, bit of picture yeah. than reading. So I'm talking about picture number 18 at page 41. Yes. Um, what was the loading of these solutions? We haven't measured that. So the way we performed it was that we had a solution uh, mixed um, that we had stirred under a CO2 atmosphere for, I think it was half an hour. And then we transferred samples of that uh, into the NMR tube and measured on it. So we haven't measured the loading in the system. Mm. Um, is it the same? Okay, let, we'll come back to that. Yes. But uh, let's first see, is it the same solution for all these temperatures that you just yes. heat up the same sample? Yes. And the CO2 does not have a you know, possibility to escape? No. Ooh. That is interesting because I was pretty sure that was not the case, but I'm happy okay. to hear that it is. <laughs> it makes it much more interesting, yes? Um, and this, of course, now sort of indicates, as you also said, that there is changes happening as, at different temperatures, even if the... Is it possible that some of the CO2 would have accumulated on the top of the tube? Sure. Um... I mean, when we have, when we heat it, of mm. course it will be released because it's then because it's capped, of course there will be, I guess, some sort of limit as well. Uh, but then when we cool it back, I mean, yes, uh, I mean the mass transfer resistance in the gas phase. Yeah, because I was wondering that is it possible that you the liquid loading is not the same in these different temperatures because you have stripped some of the CO2 yeah. on the top of the that is top of probably. the yeah definitely that yeah um, I mean it's a very small tube as well so yeah. it's a very yeah and I guess the gas phase on top is also quite small yeah but uh, did, did you you could calculate it actually or you could calculate the worst case scenario yes. which is that the <laughs> top of the uh, tube would have CO2 mm -hmm. in it and pure CO2 and, and you would, I don't know, did it tolerate pressure or can you assume that it max one bar? Uh, it was one of those capped NMR tubes, so I yeah, guess if so the pressure doesn't... was too high, it, yeah, it would I cap guess, out. Yeah. I don't know mm -hmm. the resistance mm -hmm. of that cap. So you, you could check what would be, how much CO2 could you actually lose to the top of mm -hmm. the tube maybe? Yes. I don't know, just to, to understand better if, if it's, if the case is that you actually don't have the same loading anymore yeah. in the liquid phase. Um, but there's another part of it, which is, of course, that we do see a clear changes mm -hmm. in the composition of the, of, the, uh, of the liquid. And for aqueous amines, we normally don't. For example, for MEA, if, mm. you, if, you, if the loading is constant, mm. you get the same speciation in NMR, even if you go to higher temperatures. OK. Mm. But yeah, as I said, I can't, I mean, probably the loading yeah. won't be the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, uh, but, uh, but that's, yeah. that's a side thing, because this is, of course, very interesting. Mm -hmm. Because this means that you would have a change. In a, I'm wondering, in a real process, mm -hmm. if this is true, mm -hmm. that the, the loading stays approximately constant, yeah. uh, but the speciation changes. Um, later on, you say that that uh, because of this, you, you can, this can explain why the heat of absorption at high temperatures is lower. Yeah. Which I agree. Yeah. Um, but do you think this would mean that you would have to, in some point in the process, actually provide this heat for change of, this, of the speciation in the liquid phase? Probably. I I, I'm, mean, I'm yeah. just, I mean, yeah, I, yeah. I, I, I'm just wondering, uh, it probably isn't, I don't know if it's a significant or, and it would happen probably in a heat exchanger automatic, of course, automatically, but I wonder. Yeah, I mean, in equilibrium reactions, you, I mean, you have to 
you get exothermic heat there, right? Yeah. And then they're moving yeah. back. You yeah. need to add it. So yeah. Maybe. Yeah. I don't know. It was just, but uh, this is very interesting because we, we don't see it, at least for MEA. This is not the case what happens if but the loading is constant. You don't get the decrease in heat of absorption in MEA, right? No. No. Depending on who you want to believe, you might get increasing <laughs> heat of absorption. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Which is a bit of a challenge also. Um, so, um, no, we don't, uh, we don't get. No. Yeah, it's interesting. Th this is very interesting. I agree. It's very nice. Um, you, uh, you also have in the same page, you start the discussion of the water, influence of water. Uh, yes, yes. Exactly. And I was wondering um, why five and 10 weight percents you of know, water? In the beginning, <laughs> that was just me thinking <laughs> <laughs> I should start by looking at something. Yes. Uh, that's, uh, that's and uh, then it uh, happened to turn out that five and ten weight percent was equimolar and double molar amount of AMP. <laughs> okay, <laughs> but that was a bit of a fluke, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, yeah. But th that's that's fine. That's fine. That's fine. Um, and. Um, you already in your presentation, you mentioned something that maybe this water can be removed by, or this water would have to be removed. It, yeah, I mean, depends on, I mean, depends on the amount, extent of accumulation, mm. right? Mm. I also, I mean, since we need to perform the regeneration at 90 degrees, I mean, that is still quite close to boiling point of water. So I don't know how much would actually, some will probably be evaporated. Yeah, but I, I guess you would have. Yeah. But I mean, still i think it will be a problem i mean also the amount of liquid would <laughs> keep growing i guess <laughs> um yeah it could be a real challenge um so yeah i think we'll skip the next but we go for the question discussion that we have had more than 10 years going ongoing so let's see Fantastic. if you can answer that. Uh, I know that <laughs> Helena, Helena also got the same question. So mm. it's paper one. Yes. And figure five. It's uh, given a page number five there on the. Yeah. I know where you're going. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. We all know where we are going on, <laughs> don't we? Um, in a figure five, you can see that at very low loadings, you have extremely high heat of absorptions. Yes. Can you, can you give any proposal why? I mean, I feel <laughs> the error is also larger, I think, in the beginning when you have so low amounts of CO2. And I've seen, maybe, now I don't remember if I've seen that in the pure solvents or if I only see that in the AMP mixtures. But the baseline is, in that first point is not always perfectly matched. So there is something happening there. Um, and I'm not sure. So my suggestion is that it's partly due to, I mean, the error being higher, but still, I mean, I have, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, over the years, there have been uh, different proposals why this happens, because yeah. it happens, as you know, only to some, in some systems, we don't see it in all systems. No. And depending on which university you work, you might have different beliefs why it's happening. Uh, we have tried to debug it and yeah. find out what's happening, and we we cannot get, we can't remove it, but we see less of it yeah. with the same calorimeter that you have used compared yeah. to what we have our old calorimeter. Mm -hmm. We have a bigger calorimeter, and uh, yeah, yeah. and uh, we see more more in there. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, but yeah. okay, so you, you don't have any. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you ever figure it out. <laughs> no, well, what's your plan for the next five years? No. <laughs> this, this could be a thing to figure out. 
we'll see. <laughs> I can tell you that even in my question, it says that I'm, I'm supposed to ask you if you have any guesses why this would happen. <laughs> but, <Yes>. I, I <laughs> <laughs> um, but on the same figure. Yes. Let me now see if I'm... Um, I was also thinking that... I'm sorry, it was the wrong figure. It's okay. So it's a uh, paper two, uh, figure two and three. For example, well, it sort of is the same. We can see the same yes. thing. So there you, I don't have those data points because I couldn't estimate the first data point because the um, baseline was not good. Yes. Yeah. Um, For both for this figure five and both uh, this figure two and three, mm. uh, partly it, it looks like the uncertainty is quite high. So there, I think I found some cases where there was like a small change in the temperature, but it had a huge impact on the heat of absorption. I mean, you can see that the loadings between, let's say. Um, yeah, sure. Like in, in the, the around 0 0.01. Um, and I was wondering, do you think there is, because these heat absorptions are super low. Yes. Do you think it actually impacts the accuracy of the equipment? Probably. I mean, we measure it by measuring the amount of, uh, to keep the temperature constant, right? And if it's a very low amount, I guess that would be less accurate. Um, because I, I feel that there's more, um uh, variations there was somewhere where like a small temperature change had had almost it almost doubled uh, heat of absorption here i found mm -hmm. like i mean i was looking something there but um uh it it's um mm -hmm. i mean it, yeah 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 i was just uh, yeah, curious yeah. if you have yeah. thought about it and if you have any any have you found a limit that what heat of absorption, the, the reaction colorimeter would not be any more suitable. Mm -hmm. I can't remember if we talked about that or during this, but um, not on the top of my head. Mm. Of course, for, I haven't tested how low we yeah. can go. <laughs> yeah. Of course, for practical purposes, it makes no difference, but yeah, yeah it's, it's fine. And we can continue a bit on the same on mm -hmm. the paper, paper three, when you, you talk about when you talk about your methods in paper three uh I'm, i don't or know two. if it's a paper two or three yeah. i have written yeah. paper <laughs> paper three i don't know what, what what's in paper three uh yes the paper three system yes yeah um i guess this could have asked for any yeah, yeah. Uh, for any of the papers and um on the last part of the experimental methods mm -hmm. the, and vapor Equilibrium. You say that two different ep experimental runs were performed. Yes. To ensure repeatability. Yes. And then you start to talk about uncertainties. Yes. So um, uh, maybe you can first tell what is the difference. So the uncertainties were calculated based on the uncertainty of the equipment, like the scale and the pressure transducers, etc. So we. Um, yeah, the error propagation mm -hmm. calculations. As for the uh, repeating um, experiments, it's basically to see that uh, the systems behaved similarly when we ran them twice. I mean, to get some sort of idea of um, the variation uh, based on other things than mm. just the uncertainty of the equipment. <laughs> um, but when you say that you to ensure repeatability, did you mm -hmm. have a limit for it? I mean, what point would you have said that you are not able to reproduce them, that the repeatability is low or bad? Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a bit arbitrary. <laughs> uh, I, yeah. I mean, usually it was really good. <laughs> but what does it mean that it was good? I mean, well, well, how, do you, how did you judge that it's good? Like, for example, if we look at the um, uh, uh, Henry's constant measurements, uh, 
um, the uh, the R values when we do our um, um, linear regression uh, fit very nicely, like above nine nine um, for both curves, and mm. then even when we use them together. Uh, but where the limit would be where <laughs> where it's not good anymore, I um, haven't really thought about that really. Yeah. Okay. Uh, um, it, it's just a general question. Yeah. Which one of these you would expect to be higher, the uncertainty or the repeatability? So I mean, like a higher number if you would give it as a plus minus. Yeah. <sighs> Probably the repeatability I agree on that mm -hmm. uh, do you have any reason why um, because <laughs> <laughs> there is so much other things influencing <laughs> those things <laughs> yeah yeah because yeah the, for the repeatability I mean, you have two different solutions you have more uncertainties that are potentially taken yes. into account right exactly um, of course we both know that this doesn't always be the case anyhow no so sometimes <laughs> it um the it's a very this is my final very bit more detailed question um, it's very well known that for non-aqueous systems, viscosity turns into a problem. Yes. When you absorb CO2 into it. Yes. Uh, you had some, um, you have some experience. Uh, I understand that for the, for the systems with precipitation, you cannot measure it. Yes. Uh, what your, what, how would you describe the viscosity of, of the systems you have been testing? They vary a lot. Okay. Um, so for both NMP and DMSO, I mean, the viscosity is a lot higher. Um, you can see, I mean, this slurry basically. It's, um, uh, but it's still sort of flows. <laughs> okay, that's that's a good start. Uh, <laughs> I've seen cases where, I mean, when uh, mostly for the ones that precipitate immediately, also where there's so much precipitation that the entire system is just like phase separates into this like solid cake and a liquid. Um, so, I mean, yeah. <laughs> the viscosity is high. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Mm, yeah. Yeah, I was just uh, curious to hear your experience about it yeah. and how you ex- uh, But I think it would varies between the, mm. the solvent that yeah. you use. Um, you you had some experiments with solvents that did not precipitate, right? Uh, yes. Did did you there also see a large in, well, large increase in viscosity? And the uh, one methyl imidazole system, <laughs> um, uh, that one did not have as much uh, uh, okay. temperature increase at uh, viscosity increase. Yeah. Um, it did precipitate, however, but not much um, overnight. Um, it was definitely more viscous when I poured it out than before, but um, uh, less than the precipitating systems. Yeah, uh, but uh, but you you didn't have a possibility to to measure measure the viscosity for it. Uh, I did not do for the yeah. one methyl imidazole, no, uh, yeah. because um, yeah, a loaded solution. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, because we the focus were to find something that could replace an MP with precipitation. So. I understand. Yes. Um, then I think it's time to start to look at the process as a whole. Yes. <laughs> Does this make it more scary or less scary? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, do we actually have, do we have something we could yeah. use to draw? So because I was wondering, maybe you could, uh, uh, on figure four at page, 14, you have a very simple schematic of the system. Page uh, 14, figure 14. four. 14. Yes. Four. Yeah. 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 Could you just draw it quickly? It doesn't have to be beautiful. 
my show. Here, maybe? Yep. Doesn't Yeah, well. I don't know if anybody will see this. <laughs> yeah, I saw the regret of some of my instructions. I should have told you to make it big. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's fine. It yeah. will, will, will manage. Um, in the thesis, you actually talk about a couple of things yes. that would have to be most likely done for your process to, for it to actually operate. Yes. And some of them are related to, uh, uh, for example, the absorber. Yes. Uh, you mentioned uh, intercooling. Yeah. Um, how would it change the schematics if you would actually now add the intercooling into it? Well, you would uh, take out some liquid and then uh, recycle it back and then have some heat exchange in here. Yeah. Oh, well, no, cooling. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and you probably, of course, if you have precipitation throughout the column, you probably would have need to have several of those, right? Yes. So you would have several of these, uh, which is uh, what is also done for the non aqueous systems when they are piloting. Yes. They, they intercool them throughout the whole column or at least in several places. Um, you also mentioned something else, and you mentioned this problem of having uh, that maybe uh, water is accumulating, and you are proposing some, some, <laughs> some things to avoid it. Yeah. By trying the gas coming in. Yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah. So how would that look? Yeah, then you would have uh, some sort of unit here. That, yeah. Uh, Heats it and water is evaporated. Or, yeah. Um, Some sort of heating. Heating? If you want. Oh, uh, maybe uh, you condense it away. Yes. So yeah. let's. Um... <laughs> this is my 15 minutes of fame. <laughs> Yes. Uh, I think one, one option would be actually to use sort of a wash column where you just, okay, if you have to go down to 25, it's a problem. But yeah. normally what we do, we just wash the gas with, with water and with the cold water and we control the temperature of the gas and therefore the water content. But of course, in your case, you probably don't want to do this because you don't want any water. Yeah. Um, you mentioned also other ways instead of, trying the gas that you could get rid of the water. Uh, you sort of speculate a little bit that maybe one could remove water from other parts of the of the process. Yeah. And what were those? Do you remember still? No, uh, it's, it's, it was a long time since I wrote this. Yeah, it's, it's a... <laughs> uh, what do I say? I think you mentioned, for example, that in in this in the regeneration you are. Oh yeah, sure. Um, I mean, yeah. Okay. So if we have water leaving during regeneration, yeah, um, then you could have a condenser here as well. Uh, no, you don't need a condenser, but then it would leave with the gas leaving. Okay. Um, but what would the gas contain? It would be mainly CO2. Yeah. Then it would have, I guess, some water if it leaves during this stage as well. And? And some solvent probably. And yeah. What would be the temperature of the gas? Uh, the temperature would be similar to the top of the stripper because that, yes. that was the question in the figure it's hard for me and in the text to see if you considered that there would be a condenser afterwards yeah i mean since i don't really know how this system will behave i didn't want it to add too much 
stuff in there. Yeah. Uh, I think there's a lot to figure out on yeah. how to 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 build this. Mm. But but if you would have a if you would have it at the high temperature, leaving the CO two mm. uh, and a little bit of water and and some some of your solvent, of course, what would happen to the volatility mm. of your solvent? Uh, we would lose it if uh, because we wouldn't be able to recycle it back to the stripper. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. and and you probably you could of course condense it. Yes, you could cool it down and condense it. But then we would have a water solvent mixture. Yes. Yeah. Um, which nicely leads to my next <laughs> <laughs> question. <laughs> how how would you uh, how, how do you think? Do you think you could recover the amide from this plant, from this water amine plant? Huh. Maybe. <laughs> um, I mean, it might be hard if we get the mixture. Um, could you could you boil it? Sure. I mean, there is a temperature difference. I think yeah. the boiling point of AMP is around 165. Mm. Yeah, but then you would have to. I mean, if you distill it or boil it, mm. then you have the additional energy requirements, right? And then yeah, everything at the end would be optimization. Yeah. yeah. But uh, I because I think there is another part where you would end up with a little bit similar problem. Mm. And that's is related to the volatility of the amines and your co-solvent in the absorber. Mm. Yeah, sure. Leaving with the gas that we mm -hmm. want to clean. Mm. What would you do with that? What what could you do? What could you add? A uh, solvent this? trap of some sort. Mm. Yeah. Uh, do you know what normally is used for aqueous amines? You use the water wash, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Yeah. Could you use water wash? Uh, no. <laughs> Why? Oh, well, it depends. Uh, <laughs> we don't want the water to get into the system, right? Uh, of course, you could have it as an external unit, but then you would lose the, the amine there as well, right? Yeah, but what would be the difference with, with the case not having the water wash? Like, won't you use, do you have another way of recovering the solvent? Leaving with the, the I mean, there are ways, right? Like using some sort of net structure to try to capture uh, droplets and stuff. Um, okay, yeah, that's. Uh, um, do you have droplets? I don't know. I haven't, <laughs> <laughs> I haven't really tested. I mean, we have done the proof of concept test once um, in a continuous setup, but most of my experiments are performed, uh, yeah, in smaller scales. So I mm. don't really see. Mm. But I, I think you could try to, you don't have much space, but maybe you can try to put there a small water wash there yes. on top, since it's... Uh... <laughs> and that's of course would then also yeah, add some, stuff. Yeah, yes. yeah, it would have a cooler and a circulation of water and, and all that. Um... So then we're done with that. Um... Your, your heat exchanger after the yes uh, separator. And um, in, in that heat, normally in the liquid aqueous systems, the, the heat on both, or the need for the heat on both sides of the heat exchanger is very similar. But in your case, it's not actually. Right, because you have actually slurry coming that has to also be, you need to dissolve the solids. Yes. And if you would have uh, uh, this, uh, as you, of course, in schematics, simple schematics, you have to do simplifications. If you would use only that, I feel that you would not be able to, I, I wonder, you will en end up with the rich solvent going into the stripper, which is quite low temperature. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I was wondering, have you, have you considered the option to actually add one more heat exchanger that you could use, for example, before the first heat exchanger to try to dissolve 
that would use even lower temperature heat? Definitely. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> this is not, I mean, not my expertise. Yeah, I, I understand. <laughs> I, and I, I'm, I'm not uh, trying to, I just want to have this discussion because I think it's very interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah, sure. I mean, preheat the solution before the heat exchanger. Yeah, so, because yeah. then you would get a possibility to use a really low temperature heat, yeah. maybe at 50, 60, 70 yeah, yeah. degrees, and which no one else wants to use. Yeah, yeah. And you could actually utilize it mm. in, in your system uh, beautifully. Um, you also mentioned in your thesis, take one of the questions up here, which was here. Um, on page nine, you discuss different regeneration options for aqueous amine systems or amine solvents. You, yeah. you mentioned advanced stripper, yeah, yeah, like yeah. lean yeah. vapor compression and, uh, and, uh, and I was wondering first, it's just a generic question. Do you, do you see this, what kind of connection between these different options and solvent characteristics characteristics there are actually Do, would they work as well for any solvent probably not <laughs> good <laughs> i mean a lot of those things i mean I mean, it depends on, for example, if you uh, recirculate the rich loading in order to obtain, no, that was absorption. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, okay, let's, let's go. Uh, <laughs> I agree with you. I, I, they are solvent dependent. And yes. often what we see is that for solvents that require a large regeneration energy, they, they get advantages of this. Mm. But if the solvent is already optimized, they don't really, we don't necessarily see the same advantages of these changes anymore. Uh, but then comes a the question, um, do you think that some of these would actually benefit your case? And I have no answer to this. I'm, I'm just really honestly curious. I think it's hard to say because we haven't really looked at it the normal way. <laughs> um, or whatever the normal way would be, right? Um, this is sort of the normal way. It's just that you do yeah. it at lower temperature, yes. right? You, you don't really have solids anymore in the stripper. They would be dissolved in the heat exchanger, most yes. likely. Um, I think the biggest challenge is that you, of course, don't have water vapor. Yeah, and I mean, there was, I mean, it could also be that it's beneficial to do a totally different regeneration design and not strip it like you do in yeah. <laughs> aqueous cases. Yeah. Um, but what that would look like. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and one could maybe think that maybe Vapoline recompression, for example, would probably doesn't, wouldn't help you that much, right? Because you don't really vaporize that, that much of the- No, no, no. 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 Um, so potentially some split flows maybe could help. Yeah. I don't know if that makes a difference. Um, You also mentioned that if we will have the separator in the middle there, yes, you can up concentrate the solution before it goes to the regeneration, and that that will uh, uh, have potentially some benefits for the for the stripping process. Yes, but this also means that you are sending taking something back to the absorber. Yes. So, what that impact would this have on the absorber side? What do you think? that not all solvent actually goes to the stripper. I mean, there will be a higher lean loading entering. I mean, unless you do something because there will of course be some physically dissolved CO2 in that solvent. Um, and how much that would be, I could probably not tell you right now. Um, but um, of course there are maybe do some um, flashing or something of that solution before you enter it could help. But yes, of course, if we remove some of the liquid where there is physically dissolved CO2, there will be a different lean loading compared to if we were to regenerate the entire solution. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. Of course, you have a disadvantage that in your case, the idea is that in the in the solvent itself, there is a, in the liquid phase, there is almost no CO2. This mm-hmm. is the assumption you, you are yes. having, right? That almost everything is solids. And, yes. and then this could actually definitely work. Yeah. Um, so it, it's just that I think there might be some sort of optimal case probably so that you you probably you win something but you probably lose a little bit on somewhere else but it might the outcome might still be that you end up on the positive side of yeah. course um then so now we, we have made the process to look a little bit more complex yeah definitely uh more realistic but still not, I mean, as a, as, a, as a design, it's not that more complicated than, than no, no, a normal no. process that would be there uh, in a amine based solutions. Yeah. And uh, um, so let's see. In the presentation, you were showing this uh, figure about uh, uh, cyclic capacity where you had like yes. uh, the stripping at 100 kilopascals and yeah and um, and that would allow you then to strip have the stripper at one bar yes uh, in the earlier stage you said that uh, this could be used for um, for biogas upgrading yes and the limit for co2 at the at the top of the absorber would mm. be around three percent yes do you actually get low enough lean loading with the 100 kilopascals is the lean loading that you reach so that when you cool it down to 40 or 25 that it actually is able to absorb Ooh. down to three kilopascals <laughs> let's see At 25 degrees, loading of 0. Point. For the DMSO system, uh, the loading is below, um, you get below one uh, kilopascals. Yep. I, I just, uh, I also checked it and I yeah. thought that it's fine. <laughs> I just, uh, so I knew it's going to be fine. I just wanted to uh, point out this, that there is like, uh, yes, one has to also take into account that what your limit is. So you would never be able to reach uh, 0 0.05 no. moles of CO2, for example. Um, and then, then there is my, actually my last discussion here. It's also a discussion that we have a lot on the on this field and and this is related to how to discuss cyclic capacity ah yeah <laughs> <laughs> and the, the reason is that often because for the way we do experiments and it can be also reason for other things it's nice to use uh, uh, relative numbers but the reality operates with absolute numbers yes and um and uh, this calculation i have not done so I, I do not know the answer for this, but I was just thinking when you presented the cyclic capacity for the AMP system, you said that it's around 0 0.3. Yes, moles per, per mole, mole AMP. AMP. Yes, yes, exactly. Yes. <laughs> so, so the question is that for, for MEA, if you would have, you, you said that it's around 0 0.32. Yes. So mole CO2. mole A mine. Yes. And then if you have 38% MEA, it's around 4.9 moles of uh, A mine per, if we assume that the density is one yeah, per yeah. liter solution. Yes. And uh, this gives then something <laughs> around, <laughs> something around uh, this is not what we're checking today. No, no, this is not <laughs> what we're checking today. And, uh, and I, I should have done this during the break. Yes. But, but in your system, yes. Because what, what the point of here is that what you actually get, you get how many moles of CO2 you are able to carry per liter of solution. Yes. And that would be higher in our case. That would be higher in your yes. case. When you say higher, how much higher? Like, I mean, just. Oh, this is twice. Annoying. No, I think oh, we did these calculations not that long ago. <laughs> 10 times? No, no. No, not 10 times. No, okay. Okay. it was, yeah. I think it was between one and two. 
Okay, but then that's not the problem. I mean, I think, but I, Helena did those calculations, <laughs> but we discussed it. <laughs> but I was in my pre-dissertation stress, so yeah. I was only partly there. <laughs> yeah. but because I mean, as as long as it's it's two or three or four or even five, it doesn't matter. Yeah, but it's it's just important to sort of consider also the absolute values, of course, because the loadings can be the relative numbers; they can be super high. But if the concentration of the solvent is very small, then it doesn't really give yeah. you a, a good capacity to actually and you have to carry on the process and you have to pump a lot, of course. But of course, the nice thing is that if you need a bit more solvent to do this, it also will help you with the cooling in the absorber because yeah. it, it gives you a bit more volume. Yeah, a bit more volume to absorb the heat. Not much, but a little bit more. Yeah. 1.5 roughly. 1.5 roughly, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. What would be? I don't know what your plans are now afterwards. No? And you you sort of talked a little bit about how to how to take this this how one should take the work further. Uh, do you know is there plans to take this further? Yes. Okay. Um, if everything goes well today, <laughs> I was planning actually to apply for a postdoc, um, mm -hmm. looking at um, um, a pilot to see if this works for real. Okay. So Helena has a project that. Um, Do you have a pilot? No. Yes. Exactly. Yet. Is that uh, is that is is it yet or like yet. that you are looking for? Uh... Yeah. So the plan is to build one uh, and try it out. Okay, uh, what scale are you going for? You know, since um, uh, I haven't really been part of that yet. <laughs> <laughs> uh, were you busy with something else? Uh, kind of. Yeah, okay. okay. I see, I see. Uh, yeah, you're going to have to talk to Helena about that. <laughs> yeah, because uh, I, I think we would have a pilot. Where we would only have to do something with the absorber. I think we could otherwise run it, maybe. <laughs> so let's have a chat about that one afterwards. Uh, um, of course, you have the precipitation. That is, of course. Yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but we, we have tried. We have tried it. But it's we have water soluble. It. That gives me a good feeling. Yes. <laughs> um, okay. <laughs> no, yeah. Yeah, we have we have run A and B based solvents in the pilot, and uh, yeah, we have been washing with water every now and then. <laughs> okay, that was actually all I had. Oh. Thank you. It was very nice. No, thank you. And I really so enjoyed the thesis, thanks. which is a thank you. clear sign from all the marks I have. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah. Alla alla klappar. Learning as we things. Who wants to start? Ciao, yeah. <laughs> or, or yeah. You can just put it in for a table. Okay. Um. Back to the process. Yes. <laughs> um, both me and Francesco discussed this in the break. And um, you have a column there, and you appear to be driving CO2 from the solvent. And we were just wondering what the driving force is for that mass transfer process. Because if you just have CO2 in that column, huh. and yes. there's no driving force from the interface of the liquid or the solid oh. into the gas phase. So can you speculate about that and how that column would work? Yeah, that I haven't really thought about, but I mean, you would need some sort of pressure difference, I guess, or or something that removes the carbon dioxide, right? <laughs> well, in the conventional process, you know, you have the stripping steam going. Yeah, 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 definitely. Which provides mm. the dilution. Um, so. Yeah, I haven't really thought about that. Um, 
it's, it's, it's fine. I think it's for the next project. Yeah. <laughs> Any uh, just, yeah, just, yeah. Yeah, my background is not really in process design. Um, so, um, not really sure how, uh, what's available to choose from. <laughs> um, but yeah, of course, um, having pure carbon dioxide there, no gas going through. I mean, of course you could have, but then you would um, have a mixture of gases coming out. So. Yeah, I, I mean, we have a design of an integrated regenerator and reboiler, which mm. has no reboiler. So people look at it and go, where's the steam coming from? Mm. And I think part of the answer is you don't need as much steam as people think you do to drive that process mm. of CO2 transfer from the solid or liquid phase into the vapor phase. So, okay. Mm. That sounds promising. <laughs> yep. Yep. Okay. Um, you've been talking about biogas for this process. Yes. And biogas always has some sulfur in it. Yes. So have you done any work or is somebody else doing some work in the area of you know what how the sulfur compounds interact with your solvent? Yes, I mean sulfur uh, hydrogen sulfide also reacts with amines, right? Uh, so um, I have not myself looked at this. Um, I know people have um, okay. exactly how I mean not for my system but for other amine systems. Um, but the extent of that and how that would affect, I have not uh, looked at, um, and I can't really, I mean, it's quite low. I mean, typically you, you remove the sulfur content in the gas anyway, um, if you want to, um, use it, um, so that okay. sulfur removal step will probably likely need to be in this as well. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. And um, just coming back to the wetted wall column, and if you have solids present there, did you think about how you could add that precipitation process to your analysis model? You know, because you obviously got the um, you know the model with the enhancement factors in it. Did yes. you think about because you said you couldn't use that system very well if you had solids present, but if you kind of incorporated the precipitation process in that. Yeah, I mean, how would I estimate the surface then? Because then we wouldn't really know. I mean, if I I don't think it would be possible to run it with precipitation um, because they would cause ripples on the surface over the column making it very hard to estimate the surface area. What, what's the film thickness? Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> that I don't remember. Um, as I said, it was five and a half years ago. Okay. Um, but... Um, Is it millimeters or microns? Uh, millimeters, I think. I mean, oh, I don't... I have it in a report up in my office. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, it's not millimeter. I mean, it's a very, it's a thin film spreading over this. Maybe it's, I actually, I don't remember. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, I, I just thought maybe if it was millimeters and the crystals were microns and you wouldn't see it. Ah, uh, no, so. it's probably, I mean, it's, um, it's, it's very thin. <laughs> I, um, I don't think I wrote it. I mean, those calculations out in the paper um I, I, so i'll rephrase the question do you i mean do you think the slurry that gets formed do you think it behaves as a segregated two-phase flow or a homogeneous two-phase flow um not sure homogeneous maybe okay. two <laughs> two-phase flow um, i mean the, the the crystals are quite uh mixed in there you don't get like you see like um separate crystals but of course if you let it stand for a while it sediments so yeah i was just thinking if it was homogeneous you might have a chance of 
doing something. Yeah. yeah. I haven't really tried because during these experiments, I just strictly avoided it <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because I just saw the issues that might arise if it sort of accumulated in the creases everywhere. Um, but yeah, I mean, I don't know how you would incorporate it in the model, though. Mm -hmm. I mean, you would need to add the precipitate precipitating reaction. I mean, it would be in the enhancement factor, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Thank you. It's, it's a sign of how good the dissertation is that I'm asking you all these speculation questions <laughs> rather, than, rather than anything about the dissertation itself. So thank you very much. No, thank you. <laughs> so thank you very much for the nice presentation. Thank you. So, and uh, I will follow up on like a biogas upgrade. Yeah. Because <laughs> like uh, you mentioned a lot uh, during the presentation, also in the thesis. Yeah. And uh, in the beginning, I'm not sure because like when we are talking about the biogas upgrading and uh, we have the methane as the main components and other. What did you say? Sorry. Methane. Yeah. CH4 as the yeah, yeah. main component. And the previous lecture, if we are working on this only by based on our mean, we do not need to think about the selectivity here. But like if we switch this uh, like amine, aqueous amine to these um, organic solvents, yeah. have you think about this selectivity issue? It will affect your results or not? I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, no, I haven't tried with methane in these systems. Um, um, I... Yeah, because like uh, we have another concept, uh, we use only the liquids, combined, yeah, yeah. like uh, combined with the organic solvents. Yeah. And uh, we realize that actually we change from the water to the organic solvents, the selectivity can be the problem. Okay. But uh, for your case, I'm not sure. No, I'm not sure either. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's definitely something we would need to check if it were to be used in those applications, I guess. <laughs> um, yeah. So. For the biogas upgrading, like in Sweden, I, I mean, a lot of work has been done, and even for the industrialization, and uh, they already have a lot of technology commercialized. Yeah. So, do you have some information regarding what the kind of technologies are used nowadays? I mean, they use a lot of physical absorption, I guess, uh, water based systems. Um, I think there are some amine uh, facilities, but they use MDE a mixtures with something else which is it piperacine i'm not sure i think so <laughs> <laughs> i think in sweden like uh, the most water. water they use is a uh, high pressure water yeah. spreading and uh, this also links to the selectivity so that's why i'm asking about okay. this uh, mm. consideration about the selectivity yeah <laughs> And also, I think for the viscosity, I mean, we already had a discussion <laughs> because actually for us, it's the same problem when we yeah, switch yeah. to this organic solvent, it's always like the viscosity issue. But anyhow, like you also mentioned that actually sometimes you can also like see that, uh, I mean, the fluid fluidity is very bad if we switch ML. I'm sorry, I didn't. I mean, get actually, question. like if you change it from the water to the organic solvents and the viscosity will change quite a lot. Yes, yes, yes. And my question is like, of course, like before suit absorption, you already see the viscosity. Yeah. And after suit absorption, it will change quite a lot. Or yes. It yes. The same? Okay. I think like uh, I've measured the viscosity in unloaded AMP NMP solutions. And I think it was um, around 2.6 or something at room temperature, uh, millipascal mm -hmm. second, right? Um, so, I mean, and then, uh, of course, I can't measure it after because we use these uh, <laughs> viscosimeters in glass with cap capillaries. Um, but there's a big difference uh, between them. Yes. Yeah, because we, we, met, we met the same problem, in fact. Yes. So that's why actually we try to add more organic solvents or use a water as a solvent. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and um, just like... Um, here you have this the pressure range is quite low. It's around only one around one kilopascal. And when you are talking about the accuracy, you mentioned that it's only one to two percent. Yes. So for this lower high, lower pressure, it's very. I mean. Yeah, 
I mean, of course, the um, um, the uncertainty at the lower pressures will be higher, right? Than mm. than at the higher. I mean, yeah, depends on. <laughs> um, so, do you have any numbers how high it is at the lower pressure? The uncertainty. Yes, I haven't calculated it for for different uh, pressures like that. Only like a uh -huh, average, average for the experiments, or I did. I mean, they are they are based on the individual data points, right? Uh, mm -hmm. So I have in my um, Excel file, <laughs> <laughs> I have information for the individual pressures, mm -hmm. but I don't recall. I mean, in the end, I make an average out of all the data points and report it here. Mm -hmm. um, and I can't remember now how big the difference was between the low and the high pressures, <laughs> but I can figure it out if you're interested. <laughs> yeah, because we're also working on the modeling. Yeah. Because like based on the data from others, and in fact, we noticed that sometimes the percentage can go up to 50. Okay. Yeah, so that's mm -hmm. right. <laughs> yeah, thanks a lot. Yeah. Thank you. Hi. Hey. We are going to finish. <laughs> okay, uh, thanks for the presentation, very nice. And okay. congratulations for the defense. Actually, you already answered all my questions. <laughs> so, some curiosities. Why AMP? You have uh, tried also other amines, or uh, your work is uh, only focused uh, with AMP since the beginning? Uh, it has only been focused on the AMP, okay. uh, and that is because of the uh, steric hindrance in it. We want to form the carbamet, and it can be regenerated at lower temperatures. Yes. So that's basically the main reason. Um, okay, but uh, if you consider other amine, other primary amines, such as uh, DGA that you mentioned in your yeah, presentation, yeah. Um, the, the carbamate is more stable, mm -hmm. true. but uh, in this case, you can have uh, a higher absorption rate. You yeah. have considered also this, or? I mean, sure. I mean, yeah, we, have, I mean we haven't looked at them, um, okay. but I mean, if it turns out that the AMP, for some reason, I mean, if the rate is too low or whatever, if it doesn't work, of course, it would be interesting to study other amines <laughs> um, using the same concept. Okay. okay. Um, but until now, uh, we're still, we're <laughs> hoping on AMP. Yeah, we have this. <laughs> okay. Uh, just a uh, curiosity about uh, your NMR spectrum. Yes. <laughs> Page 41. Of yes. Your thesis. <laughs> The same spectra you already discussed with uh, Hannah. Um, I also were interested in the loading because uh, the, the spectra at uh, 30 degrees is uh, very interesting. Also, because you mentioned uh, the, you, uh, the, the peak number three. Yes. That uh, you are seen tentatively <laughs> to the yes. carbonate. And uh, Okay, tentatively because is a uh, strange reaction. It's not so common that uh, CO2 react with the, the hydroxyl group in uh, uh, amine. So my, my question, my curiosity is, uh, uh, this spectra is, um, the spectrum is in um, DMSO? Yes. Yes. You try to do the same also in other solvent? Uh, um, we have looked at, the NMP solvent as well in the paper. Um, and you but we, find the same, uh, the same peak? Um, no. <laughs> the thing is, we had to use so much less concentration of AMP in the NMP system because this is the 10 weight percent system. Yes. Um, we used 2.5 for NMP because we kept getting <laughs> precipitation. <laughs> um, I ask this also because it is a, a, a strange, uh, an uncommon reaction. So I, yeah. Yeah, I, I don't, don't know if it depends from uh, the solvent or is... Uh... I mean, no, I'm not the NMR expert, right? I mean, this was a collaboration. <laughs> um, but um, I don't think we saw that 
peak in the NMP system. I mean, we didn't really see um, it's, it's, uh, it's so much lower concentration. So <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I think it's hard to determine, but um, I mean, it could be, I guess. I, I, I don't know. <laughs> no problem. But if you if you have some spectra with this speaker, please tell me <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because I never observed this and uh, it's interesting also yep. to understand the mechanism. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Also, if um, in a real situation you will never have this because I imagine that uh, you can obtain this peak uh, with high loading, but in a continuous process. Uh, Mm. Mm. and the liquid is circulating Definitely. Um, i don't know if you can obtain this but i mean sterically hindered i mean i mean that are more sterically hindered than amp they they um they can react to the hydroxyl group right yeah, okay can react <laughs> to the, <laughs> but is a, with, with a primary amine group sure uh, usually uh, the, the reaction uh, is uh, so much with, like, yeah, with yeah. The amine, yes and uh, my last curiosity well uh, you mentioned in your presentation of uh, negative emission technology yes and uh, you talk about bex but there is another negative emission technology there is uh, dsc direct type capture absolutely so you think that your system can be suitable for this technology or is uh, totally wrong <laughs> I think, I mean, the low concentrations that you need to work with in direct air capture. Uh, no, I mean, you see, yeah, yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I also tried. And yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> no, okay. I mean, there's a big difference between percent and ppm, yeah, right? Yeah, CO2 uh, for me, also 400 ppm, so yeah, it doesn't work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And then we have the coding press. Yeah. Uh, thank you for a very nice presentation and discussion. Thank you. Um, so you have mainly done experimental work, but I still would like to uh, ask you some questions about the application of this uh, system. Yeah. Um, and you. As I understand, your, your results suggest that um, biogas upgrading is uh, one good application due to the partial pressure of the yes. CO2. Um, and I was wondering, uh, when we see this uh, alternative design, yeah, um, and if you compare it to other biogas upgrading system, if you see... Um, any challenges with the scale? I'm thinking biogas plants are usually quite small. Mm -hmm. um, how they, if there are any benefits or, or drawbacks and drawbacks, I'm only thinking about scale, uh, if it's a challenge. I think, I mean, Probably, <laughs> there's always challenges. <laughs> uh, I mean, you would be able to reduce the pressure in the, uh, in the during regeneration um, compared to an aqueous system, right? That's what you use the means. Um, but I have no real feel for this, I would like to say, um, like how different they would be. I'm not sure I... Yeah. No. I, I don't have an, <laughs> no? kind of an answer to that either, but I was just thinking whether the technology, when I see the complexity, whether it would be um, more suitable at other industries, or practicing combined heat and power. Sure. We have this might not be like for the farmer next door <laughs> investing in this. Um, no, yeah. <laughs> it would require something larger, not the. <laughs> no. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. 
Okay. Thank you, Anna and Hanna. I really enjoyed the, the discussion today. It has been a real pleasure. And um, I wonder, would it be possible to have a zeolite capture of the water in that position, maybe? What do you say? I mean, then, yeah, sure, maybe. I mean, if you had it as an external unit, maybe. Yeah. Um, I have no clue about this. No? <laughs> it just popped up. So. Yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah, maybe. And another thing, you have been mentioning steric hindrance a lot. Can yeah. you please tell me why is this so important? Because it makes the molecule like less stable. Um, Less stable. I mean, you have these um, methyl groups uh, next to the uh, nitrogen. And when you react, it's this, this steric hindrance. They're sort of in a way which sort of um, makes it easier to <laughs> reverse the reaction. <laughs> so, so you mean because it cannot move once it's attached, it will be easier to remove it later? Or? No, I don't understand what you meant. <laughs> <laughs> so the reacting part, I mean, the, the molecule that has reacted, if it's too many large bulky molecules at once, mm. it is not very happy in that state. <laughs> Which, unless it was if, like for the MEA case where you don't have those methyl groups, it has not like I mean, as, has space to freely move around. Yeah, in that's the, what I mean. Yeah, so. yeah. Mm -hmm. But because we have these methyl groups, it's sort of a lot of things going on in a small area, basically. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so perhaps sad molecules for the next yes. <laughs> research project. Uh, so uh, thank you very much, uh, the grading committee. I think we can give them a hand. Uh, Uh, now it's time for questions from the audience, if there are any. Are there any from the, the web? Only a comment saying that this was very informative. Okay. <laughs> any questions from the audience in here? Yes. Laura. Yes. Uh, no. <laughs> yeah, yes. <laughs> I'm so sorry, Hannah. I'm so sorry. But... <laughs> So you, you, as you know, I, I, I used your thesis as my evening reading uh, yesterday. Yes. Uh, it was very nice. And I found a new favorite word, but I do not know what it entails. Switter ionic. Yes. What the hell is switter ionic? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> um, if you look at... I mean, it's debatable whether this switter ionic species even exists. No one has seen it as far as I know. Where is that? Oh, maybe I don't write that equation out mm, in this. It's basically a molecule in intermediate state where everything is sort of together and you have like both the positive and the negative charge within the same molecule, maybe, basically. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, it's very short lived if it do exists. Yes, I thought I had the equation, but no. Huh? Okay, page five. Okay, yeah, yeah, good. Any other questions? Uh, so with that, we conclude this session. And uh, we, uh, let's see, we will reconvene. Uh, I guess in the yeah, uh, coffee room, but that will not be online. Yeah, coffee room uh, plus one. Plus uh, one. And uh, how do we tell the audience online? Online, they have to wait for the great news of some other. Yeah, so they will get, <laughs> they will get the news eventually. But you are present here. Perhaps I should do like this <laughs> again. <laughs> uh, so you uh, uh, are on the web. Uh, nice to have had you here. And the rest of you, you are please welcome to uh, Floor Plus One. If you don't know where to go, please follow someone that seems to know what they're, where they're going. <laughs> and uh, the 
the grading committee is also meeting upstairs, right? No one down here. Okay. So, Helena knows where. Helena knows where. So the grading committee follows Helena and the rest follow someone else. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.